car like this would be really good to just use and enjoy like it is. Out here to see a car collection auction today. This will be video number one, the walk around. Video number two will be auction action. And first car we're looking at is this 1948 Packard four-door sedan. Packard had a very storied history as a company, and this was their first post-war offering. Of course, during World War II, they had built airplane engines as well as engines for the PT boats. Just a short five years after they built this car, they would be forced to merge with Studebaker, and then a short 10 years after this car, Packard name was gone as a company. Now the plant's being demolished, and so relics like this are the tangible reminders we have left of this once great company. This body style actually dates back to 1942, but this 1948 was heavily revised. Take a look inside. Now these are like vault type door handles. Very, very nice car inside. Very well kept. Several low mileage survivors on this sale. You see the quality of the materials, the craftsmanship that went into one of these cars. Very, very few survive totally original in this condition. It's just the experience of the quietness in here and the smell. It really is a true time capsule vehicle. See that wood graining I believe was applied by hand. There is a base coat and then another layer over that. They would apply with a kind of a feather style brush. This car overall just very, very well kept. It'll be the first one to sell on the auction, so we'll see what happens. Believe the paint's original, but it's a little harder to tell on that. These post-war Packards were a triumph of engineering as it relates to factory production. They actually used the 1942 greenhouse and then pretty much wrapped all the lower body around it. Few people criticized it at the time, but when you consider what Packard had to work with in converting to post-war production, and compare it to other envelope bodies at the time, they actually really pulled it off quite well, and it endures to this day. And for comparison of another envelope body, right next to it we have this 1949 Chevy Fleetline Fastback. This was of course a continuation of the Fleetline Aero Sedan styling theme. This one, of course, being Chevrolet's first all-new post-war body. And these are just a very timeless design. That sloping roof. Pontoon rear fenders. It's a very, very timeless styling on this car. Pretty popular in California. And really all over. Of course, black very appealing color on this car it just helps to accent the lines sets off the stainless being a lighter color the chrome bumpers and the grill about all this thing really needs is a proper set of wide white wall tires this car's been Pretty much completely restored, repainted. Low mileage survivor that's been kept up through the decades. 
tiny little oval tail lights. They were good enough for the time, but they definitely wouldn't pass for today. 49 has the one year only flat deck lid emblem, so that's a pretty easy visual cue to identify them from the rear. This one, of course, has the factory fender skirts. You could get sun visors on these. A lot of other accessories, but you gotta remember in this era, things we take for granted today were extra cost. Heater, radio, clock, all of that you had to specify as an option in order, because the base model cars came without them. This one looks like probably in the 60s somebody's put some gold paint in here. Kind of gives it a little bit of a vintage retro flair. This upholstery, probably 80s, 90s era. It's got the multicolor velour. Main color's gray, but when you look close, it's got the other little flecks of color in it. Well done. Not exactly authentic, but a car like this would be something just really good to use and enjoy like it is. Let a kid sit in there with an ice cream cone, wipe it off, and not have to worry about it. Of course, the three-speed manual was the only transmission available in 49. Power Glide wasn't an option till 50. Owning one of these is pretty easy experience as far as a collector car goes. There's tons of aftermarket parts around for them, tons of used parts. They just built millions of them and there's still a lot around. This one's definitely on my list. Next we've got a 1958 Chevrolet Delray four-door sedan. The 58 Delray was the cheapest model, and it's actually the only year that the Delray name was used as a standalone model. It did pop up in 1956, but it was a submodel of the 210, so 58 is the only year it was a standalone on its own. Being the cheapest car, for whatever reason, Almost all 58 Delrays that I've seen at least are two-tone. So maybe it was a cheap trick to spice up a cheap car. This one's preserved, completely original down to the hubcaps. About all it needs is a set of either white walls or black walls. A Delray would be appropriate with either. But white walls would set off the two-tone, I think. This one, just a beautiful, original, time capsule survivor. It's got a little bit of rust popping here and there, but this is just excellent, excellent 20-footer car. Very well preserved, one that would be proud to leave just like it is. So many cars get restored. And when that happens, you just lose a lot of the original look and the original feel. And if you look at where the market is today, the ones that are really bringing the money are the ones that are the original unrestored ones. Now we all know you can dump big money in a car and get big money out of it. But the other thing about these original cars is they just generate a lot of interest and buzz because people want to see them how they were when they came off the assembly line. Once it's sanded down and redone, you lose all of that. They're only this way once. Typical car of its time under the hood. Straight six, 235, three-speed manual, manual brakes, Manual steering, heater, just a good basic car that would run a long time if you gave it 
Just a little maintenance. Everything about this car is excellent. No rock chips, no pitted chrome, just a beautiful survivor all the way around. Now here's my favorite car of the auction. Maybe not the most attainable to me, but this is a 1934 Buick. Beautiful, beautiful restored car. The only thing I can really knock on it is they were too cheap to chrome the bumpers, so those have been painted. And realistically, on the cheap side, a one-piece bumper to replate it now is like 500 bucks. If you really wanted to do these nice, you'd probably be looking closer to seven or 800 bucks. But on a car like this, definitely, definitely worth it because the rest of it is just a beautiful, pristine, immaculate restoration. Two-tone, burgundy and black. Very, very striking visual appearance with the dual side mounts, the dual horns. Just a true classic automobile. I don't think it would be considered a full classic by the CCCA because it is 50 series, I'm pretty sure. Still 32, 33, 34 hardest years of the depression but the very highest styling peak and so those three years will always be rare they will always be very limited very hard to find these cars had structural wood in the body so to find one that hasn't been left outside to decay and just literally rot away Every one of these that still survives and still is in this condition is incredibly exceptional. Especially when you consider during World War II, these were 10 year old cars and a lot of them went away in the scrap drives. And during this time, the body stamping dies hadn't been developed yet to be large enough to stamp out a full size roof stamping and so these are multi-piece bodies that they would weld together and finish with lead seams so every 1934 and most of your 1935 GM cars still had the fabric insert for the top and one of these sits outside very many decades that rots away and the rest of the body goes with it. See this one also has the integral trunk with a luggage rack on the back. So very modern integrated trunk with a little bit of a vestigial tail still there on the back. But by 36, 37 the integral trunk was basically completely adopted and the old external trunks were just really a thing of the past that had gone away. Look inside this car and you can see very subtle yet beautiful Art Deco styling integrated throughout. You've got the wood grain trim. This was really when Harley Earl and GM's Art and Color was starting to come into its own. 1927 LaSalle was his very first design. And in the early 30s, the harmony of all the design elements really began to flow. And 32, 33, 34, 35, just to me, will always be the best years of automotive styling. I know you guys like to think of me as the 70s and 80s car guy but these few years in the mid 30s you just can't beat them and at this point in my life they're still a little bit unattainable to me but I've definitely got cars like this on the list
Looks like this one still needs a little work with the wiring. These, of course, would have had cloth wiring originally. You can see very well done inside of this car. It's a beautiful restoration. It'll be my guess on sale that this probably will be the highest selling car. Where else are you going to find something like this? This old timer is a Rio truck. Of course, Rio was Ransom Eli Old's second company. He started Oldsmobile and then left it and started Rio. Initially built cars and then expanded the line to trucks pretty quickly. This one's a little hard to date. It's got the pre-wings radiator ornament. I'm going to say it's early 20s. Came a long way from Montana to join the collection here. In this era, they were still called motor trucks. And it's just a very basic rudimentary hauling vehicle. You can see typical of the era. There are no front brakes, just the wheels mounted on the spindle. This one's got tow hooks, which is kind of neat. Probably an aftermarket bumper. See there, still crank start. Really neat oil pan on this. Has those odd cooling fins. These old 100-year-old vehicles, they're just really, really fascinating to look all the way around because there's just so many design details and engineering that they were basically figuring it out as they went and just kept improving them. Cab is pretty much entirely made of structural wood including the entire doors themselves. Just pretty neat to see how they did it. Very, very few basic creature comforts of this were only what you needed to operate the thing and get it on its way. Windshield cranks open for ventilation, no carpet, Nothing like the trucks that we use today. The windows are all flat plate glass. I would imagine something like this would probably ride pretty rough when it's empty. Get some weight on there. Might smooth out a little, but not much. So here would be a contemporary companion to the Rio truck. This is a uh, international. This one's all steel structurally. So very different cab construction than the Rio. This one does not have a front bumper. That's pretty typical of just about all your 1920s vehicles. Toward the end of the 20s, they did start to become standard, but early on a lot of aftermarket companies did supply them, so you could put one on if you wanted to. This one does have a fabric roof covering, so there may be some structural wood in there. Very, very similar to the Rio. People say modern vehicles all look the same, but I think you could just about pick any era and probably say that as well. Very similar mechanically to the Rio. Again, no front brakes. 1920s were really a growing time in International Harvester Company. In the 20s, 30s, 40s, it really expanded into a dominant manufacturing company. So here you can see inside the cab and it actually is all structural wood 
So that steel skin is just nailed on. This is, of course, a carryover from the old buggy days. Pretty Spartan inside, just purely a workhorse. Pretty similar arrangement to the Rio with the flip out windshield and the crank up windows. This one's got a grain bed with the little door that flips out to empty it. See the monogrammed logo on the differential cover. And typical of the era, it has external contracting brakes. The friction material is a band on the outside. It's a very uncommon setup, but these are three-quarter elliptical overload springs. Things like this are why teens and 20s and earlier brass era vehicles are just very, very fascinating to look around, to see all of the features that began in the early days of motoring. A truck like this would have been pretty common to see on a harvest crew a hundred years ago. And this truck would have had a two-speed rear end as well, controlled by this lever down on the floor. There you can see it. Again, just looking over one of these vehicles that's over 100 years old, if you ever get the chance, just take some time, look over them, study them, because you're going to find a lot of fascinating engineering details. I know a lot of us take for granted where we've come from. Here we've got a 1928 or 29 Model A pickup. This one's fully restored and presented very, very well. Of course, in the mid-20s, people were taking their Model T runabouts and removing the turtle decks and putting pickup beds on them. So Ford got the message and started to build pickup boxes to put on the T's. And by the time Model A days rolled around, the pickup was regular model in the lineup and basically introduced the Model lineups as we know them today, pickups and cars started to become separate right about this time. Of course, you could get the Model A Double A truck, which was a heavier capacity one, more along the lines of the International or the Rio, but this light duty pickup was built pretty much alongside the cars and from the cowl forward and the chassis, pretty much shared everything with the Model A sedans, coupes, roadsters, and others they built on the line. These are actually less common body style, probably because most of them were worked to death. You see a lot of two doors and four doors and coupes around, but these pickups, they're just not very commonly left in good enough shape to put back together and restore like this one has been. So they definitely attract a good enthusiast following and one restored like this probably will bring fairly strong price at the auction. This is a 1926 Chevrolet touring car. This would have been Four-cylinder powered, 1928 was the last year of the four, then they switched over to the six in 1929. So this was somewhat of a competitor to the Model T, or the Overland, or the Star. Immaculate restored car, the quality of the paint and body on this is just unmatched. Probably over restored when compared to how this thing would have left the factory. Beautiful, beautiful car with very little use or any 
chips or dings or anything on it just immaculately presented pretty cool old relic my classic mobile tire this paint has been blocked out and color sanded to just a mirror finish gloss Definitely not a quality restoration that you see very often. By the end of the 1920s, the touring car body was rapidly going away, and by the mid-30s, this body style was totally gone. So here's a better look at the external contracting brakes. You can see the drum is actually in the inside, and those bands go around the friction material in there. These are of course mechanical so you can see all the rods and levers that actuate them. One thing to say about this you're never gonna have to replace a leaky wheel cylinder. The interiors of these cars of this era were just as basic as the trucks. It was a rudimentary form of transportation to get you from one location to another. This is a 1931 Model A Coupe. They only built a five window. Did not build a three window until 32. Very similar visually to the 1930. This one's of course finished in black with cream wheels and the rumble seat. Rumble seats were going away by about the mid 30s. They were gone. People just wanted trunks and you could only ride out in the open on the nice weather months. So people just adopted trunks, especially after the external racks and the trunks that mounted on them pretty much went out of fashion. Very well restored car. There's tons and tons of aftermarket stuff available for these and they made a lot of these cars. So over the decades there's been quite a few good examples to pick from to restore. The 30 and 31 Model A's tend to hold more value than the 28-29's. They're just a little bit more refined, a little bit more modern cars. Still have the feel of driving something antique. This one is restored immaculately in the inside. Probably better than new. One step, two steps, and you're in. Next is this 1931 Chrysler, another beautiful, immaculately restored car. This car is as magnificent as the man who bears its name. Walter Chrysler was truly a unique blend of practical engineering expertise and financial and managerial. Just a blend that very, very few other people in corporate history have managed to pull off. And he had a lot of experience in the automotive field, started out at Buick, and then he helped turn Willys around financially, and then took over the Chalmers Corporation, and out of Chalmers is what became Chrysler in 1925. So this car was built really before the company was even 10 years old. Yet, for such a young brand and a fledgling company, it had decades of Walter's experience behind it. And so, coming out the gate 
they were just a well-engineered, well-constructed, durable, total package of a car. 1928, Walter Chrysler acquired Dodge, so there were cars as well as trucks in the line. And also 1928, he expanded to the low-priced Plymouth and the DeSoto. So in the 1930s, the line was complete. And by the time this car came around, you could have any vehicle from Chrysler Corporation at any price point. Vehicles of any era are all going to have their individual styling cues. But there's just something about the decade of the 30s that will never be repeated. Choose any corner and any angle of this car, and it's just pure art. These Chryslers did have all steel bodies, although in places in the interior there was still some wood for tacking the upholstery materials in. Pretty basic dash, basic all around, but you know you're driving a top line car. Of course they did have the Imperial available also. This is just the regular Chrysler. We've got a couple Ford Model TT trucks. This is a early style one with an all wood cab. Very similar to the Rio. And then next to it you can see the C cab there. Two very different styles, very different designs. Obviously the all wood cab is closed. And the C cab would be open to the elements. Very basic, rudimentary vehicle. Most of these were bought for farm chores, although I'm sure in the cities they would have hauled coal and ice and other commodities of the period that consumers used. Another 100 year old vehicle, no front brakes. Those didn't come till later. C cab. Probably the more desirable body style, just because it is all steel. I don't exactly know the production numbers on these, but I'd be curious to know how rare it is compared to the cabin chassis that that wood cab would have been built on. Another excellent, excellent restored 1926 or 27 Model T. This is a closed car, so compared to the 1926 Chevrolet Touring car, this is definitely the way the market was headed, and just a lot more comfortable car for driving in any sort of weather. See the obvious advantage, it would keep the rain out, keep the cold out, even though the heaters that these had weren't much. They had kind of a duct piece on the exhaust manifold that would get some lukewarm air into the cabin of the car. And then the other 1926-27 Model T is this coupe. Very well restored car. Both of these are probably better than new. This one has the wire wheels. The 26 and 27 T's, they were proofing a lot of the updates and changes that would be brought in on the 1928 Model A, and those wire wheels were one of them. But all the way around, it is still a Model T, and they had clung on way, way longer to producing these than where the rest of the market was. 
a lot of other offerings model t definitely couldn't quite catch up to old henry was stubborn and he clung on and almost cost the company still a very basic car in this form see there's no bumpers 1928 model a the bumpers did become standard two very very well restored cars better than average this is a 1925 ford model t runabout and this one has the distinction of being the cheapest model t ever produced 1924 they were $265 for this body model, and in 1925, that price dropped to $260. I really like the warm original vibe that this car has. It's got a neat aftermarket front fender brace. A lot of these companies popped up and issued things that were... Just improvements and accessory parts to make these cars more functional. Or in the case of the fender brace, to save them from being beat to pieces on the dirt roads. This time, once you got out of the cities, there really was no pavement. And most of the places where these cars were driven were very rough. And... Consequently, that's the reason that they still had these very big wheels on them. You could climb potholes and stones and obstacles a lot easier than a smaller diameter tire. Always need to carry a spare. Super, super neat period accessory there. Daughter would have to be pretty small to fit in here. It's hard for me to describe why, but this car out of everything here is just my favorite. It has such a time-worn look to it, and even though it's been updated and maintained, Obviously the oak floorboards are incorrect, but overall it just has a look that it's earned the wear that it has, all the dings and dents, and they've just kept it going. A car like this really shouldn't be a survivor. They were made to be used, and after time... The technology was so old, I mean, 10 years later, 1935 car, just so different from this. It's amazing the amount of aftermarket parts that are still available for tees. You can still get everything mechanically 100 years later to keep one of these up. And I wouldn't say the whole car's reproduced, but there's a lot. That's my old Jeep. Is it? Yeah, he bought he, 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 uh, man bought it for a thousand dollars. Wow. Was it red when you had it? No, I did all the work on it. Okay. I built it up, put a new top on it, these seats in it. Uh, kind of junk pile when I bought it. Wow. I'm going to take a closer look, but what I'm seeing here, this is a original military Jeep. Obvious giveaway on the back is that there's no tailgate. It's got the military wheels. Take a look inside, and we've got nomenclature plate on the dash. And you can... Just look and see all the little things that make this military jeep. That turret there, stamping, 
is where the machine gun pedestal would have mounted. Got the fuel tank under the seat. Twelve thirty of forty two. This thing is just such a historical relic. See if this will focus on the plate there. This thing's obviously been, I'd call it refurbished, not necessarily restored. But if it was truly a junk pile when he bought it, then at least the thing's been preserved. But this is one that you hope the next collector will take it back to its battlefield appearance. I don't know that much about these. If there's a lot of actual military pieces reproduced for them, or how much a person would have to source used. Under the hood. Hard to tell what's original and what's not, but there you go.
gonna buy one of these? Oh, <laughs> not really a tractor guy. I just film for my YouTube channel.